Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for ASME's Tech Talks. These talks are a monthly one-hour webinar series that will focus on topical subject matters in a variety of mechanical engineering disciplines, represented by ASME's technical divisions and technology groups. I'm Barbara Zlotnick, Senior Manager of Technical and Engineering Communities at ASME. Today's moderators are Erkan Oderkus, Track Chair for the IMECI 2021 Advances in Aerospace Technology Track, along with Wen Ben Yu, Chair of the ASME Aerospace Division. Now I will turn it over to Wen Ben and Erkan for further introductions. Wen Ben? Thank you, Barbara. Uh, do we have that slice up? Okay. Yeah, as Barbara mentioned, this is a, a tech talk sponsored by our division. And uh, we really appreciate you taking time to attend this webinar. My name is Wen Bin Yu, a faculty uh, in Purdue University. And they, first, let me give a brief introduction to the aerospace division so that uh, you will know what we are about. And also, if you want to get involved, uh, please let us know. Our mission is to promote the development and the dissemination of the mechanical materials and the other engineering aspects of aerospace systems. And we have an executive committee. We meet monthly. If you want to observe uh, how, you know, what other activities is happening in this division, I think uh, observing our executive committee meeting will be a good channel. So please let me know if you're interested. I can send you the calendar invite. And currently within ASME, we have more than 5,000 members indicate their interest in uh, aerospace division as their first interest. And more than 1,300 indicated as their second uh, interest. Very recently, uh, the aerospace division grow into B2 divisions. So there's another branch, uh, uh, it used to be our one of our branches. Now it become a new division called SMISIS, Smart Materials, Adaptive Systems, and Intelligent Systems. We are in charge of several awards, including the famous spirit of St. Louis Medal and Daniel Guggenheim Medal. And there's also the well-known ASME Boeing based paper award in the structures and materials community in the proportion based paper award and based student paper award. We mainly uh, co-organizing the conference uh, and the participating conference, uh, conferences at the a ASME IMEK conference and also AIA Proportion Energy Forum and SciTech Forum. And we are also working on two future initiatives uh, including studying a new journal sponsored by the division and also a start a conference by the division. So uh, this is a brief introduction. Again, if you want to get involved and uh, we have a lot of opportunity for you to have, please uh, get in touch with me. And uh, next I will turn the floor to uh, Erkan to introduce our speaker today. Thank you very much, Mamin. It's, it's an honor and pleasure for me to introduce you today's Tech Talk speaker, Professor Erdogan Manasi. Erdogan Manasi is a professor in the Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering at the University of Arizona. Prior to that, he worked at Northrop Corporation, the Aerospace Corporation, and the Fraunhofer Institute. He also worked at the Royal Institute of Technology. NASA Land Resource Center, Sandy National Lab, and MIT as part of his sabbatical leaves. He's the lead author of four books, and his research has in part led to the publication of 300 journal and conference papers. He also recently started the Journal of Peridynamics and Non-Local Modeling as a co-editor in chief. He's a fellow of ASME and an associate fellow of AIWA. Before we get started, I would like to let our audience know that there will be time for Q&A after the talk. As you think of questions, please submit them through the Q&A box located within your Zoom screen. And now it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Erdogan Manasi. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Wendy. 
Hiç profesi manas. Thank you, Erkan, for the kind introduction. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this uh, presentation. And also I would like to uh, thank the attendees uh, for their interest and participation in this presentation. Today, I'm going to talk about paradynamics and its applications in aerospace structures. And here's an outline. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, for about 10 or 15 minutes on paradynamic theory, paradynamic differential operator, and describe how you can couple paradynamics with finite element analysis in a, 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 a commercial uh, finite element program that's ANSYS. And I'll show you some applications and end my presentation with some remarks. And um, paradynamic theory was introduced by Stuart Silling um, in year 2000. Uh, Dr. Silling is, is a scientist at San Diego National Laboratories. As you would expect, he's a, a brilliant person, but also extremely humble. Um, and he um, generalized the theory in year 2007 and provided a very rigorous mathematical foundation. And what paradynamics means is, in Greek, it means a near force. So um, Zimmerman um, in 2005 published the first PhD thesis under the supervision of Professor Abay Aretne at MIT. And as you see in this plot here, um, for between 2000 and 2008, uh, there was very little activity. There was quite a bit of skepticism in, in, in the community. But then it really uh, took off, and there's an exponential growth in terms of citations, in terms of publications. There's a tremendous amount of growth. And it's not only in the United States, but it's China, it's Europe, so it's, it's all over the world. So that's, uh, as you can see here, the number of documents coming out of different countries growing exponentially as well. And there are five books on paradynamics. The first one is on paradynamic theory and its applications. It's been translated to Chinese and Persian. And there's Handbook of Paradynamics. There's Introduction to pra uh, Practical Paradynamics. Then uh, Paradynamic Differential Operator for Numerical Analysis. That's also been translated to Chinese recently. And a very recent one is on paradynamic modeling, numerical techniques, and applications. Uh, we also have a journal which started in 2018. The first issue came out in 2019. It's growing very um, nicely. It is, there's healthy growth. We, um, there are many other applications uh, other than just fracture modeling, uh, thermal diffusion, moisture concentration, image analysis, animation, digital image correlation, soft tissue modeling, just some examples here. So what is paradynamics? What's the basics of paradynamics? Um, these are the two sort of landmark papers, 2000, 2007 by Dr. Silling. It really unifies the mechanics of continuous and discontinuous media with a single consistent set of equations by bridging across length scales. Okay? It is a continuum approach without any spatial derivatives and it restores non-local interactions. As you see in this figure here, we have this, this point X in the local classical mechanics, it's only influenced by its immediate neighbors. Whereas in paradynamics, I'm looking at this point X here, it's influenced by the other points within the sphere. And the radius of the sphere delta serves as the internal length parameter. So the, 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 the sort of main sort of robustness of paradynamics is that it enables damage initiation and propagation by removing interactions among material points. So that way we can nucleate damage in unspecified locations, damage propagation is, is, is unguided, and you can have um, emergence of multiple damage sites and their complex interactions. So um, more on paradynamics, basically what uh, Dr. Silling did is he looked at this divergence of the stress tensor, and he said, if I can replace this with an integral representation here, and also in the integrand, if I don't have any spatial derivatives, it's a good thing. Then I don't have to worry about singularities, okay? And as later on, he proved that as the, the horizon um, approaches zero, this integral representation recovers the divergence of stress uh, tensor. So um, as I mentioned, there are no spatial derivatives in the integrand. We have the internal length parameter, which is the, the radius of the sphere. And because there are no spatial derivatives, it's valid even you have discontinuities. And that's the paradynamic equilibrium equation that you see here. And the point X that's of interest is gonna be interacting with other material points, X prime, and it's symmetrically located at the center of the sphere. And as a result of the deformation, the 
the, the force is developed and at point X and X prime, you have these force density vectors, T and T prime. And by breaking the interaction, basically you are initiating failure and, and growth. Boundary conditions, um, in position of the displacement constraints, they're natural because the unknowns are, the unknown is a displacement field. The non-zero attractions, um, they're enforced as uh, body forces. Now, one issue that I need to mention here, if X is not, uh, doesn't have a, a symmetric uh, horizon, in other words, if the horizon is truncated, then, um, then you have to come up with some surface corrections, okay? That's something that you need to be aware of. So how do we handle damage? Um, as I mentioned before, we monitor what goes on between these two points, X and X prime. And when the stretch reaches a critical value, we break the bond and the stretch is defined in a very simple way. The final length minus the initial length divided by the initial length. And we have a status parameter mu. If the stretch is uh, larger than the critical stretch, then the status parameter becomes zero. Basically in the, um, the, the internal force vector here, the contribution, the, the basically the force goes down to zero, right? If it's intact, we have one. And the fact that you have one bond uh, broken doesn't mean that you're going to have a, a crack. So we also have a measure of the damage. So we'll look at um, the ratio of broken bonds to the total number of bonds associated with a particular point here. If you see this point here, initially it has basically a full interactions. And now here when the crack appears, this point X lost half of its interactions on the other side of the crack surface. So if it's about 0.5, then we have a crack surface. And the, uh, the, the main idea in this, uh, in this case really was driven by or introduced by Silling and Ascari in 2005. So we also have um, the classification of uh, paradynamics, uh, depending on what the interaction domain is. For example, here you have X and X prime, they share the same family members. There's a, a pairwise direct interaction, and we call this the bond-based paradynamics. The derivation of the equation for this requires a micropotential, which I will show you in the next slide. That's bond-based paradynamics. And in the case of ordinary state-based paradynamics, material point X and X prime, they have their own family members. There is the direct interaction, but there is also the indirect interaction. So um, for the derivation of the force density vector, T and T prime, you need the paradynamic form of the strain energy density function. And there is the non-ordinary state-based paradynamics. Again, X and X prime, they're their own family members. And um, you can use the classical form of strain energy density function. However, you need to have the paradynamic form of the deformation gradient tensor. So the next slide, here I have the bond-based paradynamics. As I mentioned before, X and X prime, they share the same family members interaction. And you need the, uh, the micro potential for that. There's, for this particular material that Silling introduced in 2000, you have the microelastic brutal material. This is the micro potential. And C here is the, the micromodulus, uh, micromodulus, that's known as the bond constant. So by taking the derivative of the micro potential, you end up with the, the force density vector F. And there are no kinematic assumptions. You need to calibrate the strain energy densities coming from the paradynamics and from the classical continuum mechanics to determine the value or the expression for the micromodulus. This is what, what it is in terms of the shear modulus, but there is a reduction in material constants. So depending on the dimension of the analysis, this Poisson's ratio is either one over four or one over three for plane stress. And here's an example of what you can do um, with bond-based paradynamics. So this is a simulation of the, uh, the impact on a glass through a particle. And we basically, um, applied bond-based paradynamics, as you can see here, it very nicely captures the characteristics of the damage. This is only through the, uh, the critical stretch criteria that I mentioned. Next is uh, ordinary state-based paradynamics. Um, X has its own family members, X prime has its own family members. There is the direct interaction and there is the indirect interaction. And um, the paradynamic form of the strain and density function for this particular linear paradynamic solid was suggested by Silling in 2007. And um, this is the, the, the non-local representation of the dilatation term. This is the bulk modulus and omega here is the weight function. So by taking the derivative of the strain energy density function, you can come up with the expression for the force density vector. And here you have linear kinematic assumptions. It also requires calibration. And there is an example of what you can achieve in terms of crack growth pattern uh, 
estimation, it, this is a uh, cross section of a uh, ceramic matrix composite. You have a pre existing crack here. It basically very nicely, in an autonomous way, uh, gives you the, the propagation path for the crack. And next is non ordinary state based paradynamics. As I mentioned before, you need to have the uh, paradynamic form of the deformation gradient tensor. Then you can rewrite the strain energy density function in terms of the deformation gradient tensor. Um, that allows you to determine the Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor. And um, K here is the shape tensor, which is nothing but the sort of geometric relationship that you have between the material points. Uh, that's, um, and vector G here is expressed in terms of the, uh, the weight function and the inverse of the shape tensor. There are no kinematic assumptions, no need for calibration. Um, however, there is um, this one issue here that, that introduces some spurious oscillations that I'll talk about later. And here's an example of what you can achieve um, with non-ordinary state-based paradigmics. Here we simulated the Taylor impact test. We have a complicated uh, johnson cook plasticity damage model. We have um, the strain loading, strain rate hardening, uh, thermal softening. Um, we have heat due to plastic dissipation. So it's a very complex model. As you can see, very nicely captures the experimental um, uh, measurements here. So in summary, what we have is in paradynamics, there's no smoothness requirement in the displacement field. Failure initiation through bond breakage and bond-based and ordinary state-based um, paradynamics, the material parameters we have, they're dependent on the horizon size. So when you're near the boundary, you need surface corrections. In uh, non-ordinary state-based paradynamics, we have zero energy deformation mode, but we can remove this uh, uh, by, by, by removing the radial symmetry sort of mitigates these oscillations. What are the challenges? So we have, um, we'd like to have non-uniform horizon. We want to impose the boundary conditions without using fictitious boundary region. So we want to impose the displacement constraints and non-zero attractions in the form of a body load. So we want to um, uh, re eliminate that. Um, so we also want to couple uh, paradynamics with FEM because paradynamics is computationally expensive. Uh, we also would like to perform analysis in existing FEM software. So in an effort to answer some of these questions, uh, we extended the original concept of paradynamics. We said, okay, if we look at point X, it doesn't have to be um, uh, symmetrically located in its um, horizon. It could, be, it could have an arbitrary position, uh, same, similar for X prime. They don't have to be um, in, a, in a sort of regular uh, sphere or, a, or a, a circle. They could have arbitrary family members. And um, um, the degree of interaction among the members could be different. The spacing could be different. Um, the entity of each point could be different. It, it's not only for spatial um, derivatives, but also you could have, for example, a non-locality in time, not non-locality in space, but non-locality in time. So we, we basically, uh, came up with this extension. As a result, we um, introduced this paradynamic differential operator. So what it is, is you construct the paradynamic functions. They're indicated by G here. And um, you integrate over the domain of interaction, HX. It gives you the local derivatives that's of interest, okay, in M dimensions and nth order. Um, how do we construct the paradynamic functions? We have this orthogonality property that I'm not going to go into. So depending on, on the, uh, the order of the analysis and the order of the derivatives that's of interest, um, you can choose the paradynamic functions in terms of polynomial uh, functions with unknown coefficients by enforcing the orthogonality property allows you to determine the unknown coefficients and you put the paradynamic functions back into this expression here, you have the expression for the local derivatives. And here's an example of this paradynamic differential operator. So we rewrite this um, differential equation in fourth order nonlinear in its paradynamic representation and um, subjected to periodic boundary conditions in this initial condition. It's a very uh, challenging problem to solve, but it's, it's very suitable to recast the local differential equations in their paradynamic representation. And um, if you want to learn more about paradynamic differential operator, um, there's a book out, as I mentioned before, and uh, it addresses many different uh, topics. And uh, also, you can download the codes for each of the examples that we have in the, uh, in the book. So why do I call this paradigmic differential operator? So if you consider the same, this, this material point x, but this time 
with a symmetric position in the domain of interaction. Then you can analytically uh, construct the, uh, the, the paradigmic functions, and then you can develop these expressions for the gradient of this function or the, the, the del operator so you, and the divergence of the vector field. So this is analytical representation of this in terms of the, uh, the paradigmic functions. And if I substitute for the deformation gradient tensor, the internal force vector, or the divergence of the stress tensor, I can, by substituting these, I can rederive these expressions in this fashion here. These are the same as what Sealing um, published in 2007. So that's the reason why we call this paradigmic differential operator, because there is this connection. Now, if you examine um, the, um, the internal force vector, um, in bond-based, ordinary state-based, and non-ordinary state-based paradynamics by considering this isotropic expansion and with a complete horizon with radial symmetry. It turns out that as long as you're away from the boundaries, these are exactly equal to zero. Okay. But however, if you are near the boundary with, with an incomplete horizon, so they are not satisfied, they're not equal to zero. This is for a homogeneous deformation. Therefore, near the boundaries, you end up with residual forces. Okay, so that's why fictitious region becomes necessary for imposing boundary conditions. And if you want to couple it with finite elements, then you need to have a transition region or a morphing region. So we said, okay, can we uh, do something else to avoid this um, fictitious region and also the morphing region? So we said, let's look at the alternative form of the paradigmic equation of motion. This is the classical equation of motion we have. These are the uh, uh, traction components. So now we apply the paradigmic differential operator on this equation here, and we can rewrite this in this particular form here. And also we write the paradigmic representation of the, the stress tensor. And I'm gonna consider the same isotropic expansion and substitute into this equation here is zero everywhere because of the fact that I can have X um, located arbitrarily in the domain of interaction, okay? non-symmetric position. So with this in mind, we said, okay, um, why don't we just couple all these uh, equations that we have? So then we split the domain into three regions. Interior region, I call that D. We have the bond-based, ordinary state-based, and non-ordinary state-based internal force vectors derived by ceiling. And then for the, uh, the boundary region here, I call this R. So we use the, the internal force vector based on paradigmic differential operator. And the boundary conditions, that's uh, this boundary layer region B, and I'm gonna write the, um, the paradigmic representation of the st a stress tensor. These are my applied tractions. This is the applied displacement constraints. In this construction here, there is no fictitious region. And here's an example of that. So we consider a plate on the stretch. So we have roller supports, roller supports. We apply this displacement stretch, traction free. And um, this is our discretization. This is the interior region, this is the, the outer region, and this is the boundary region here. And um, we applied the, the displacement constraints and the uh, conditions that we have um, on the roller supports. As you can see here, we compare the results against the finite element predictions and also the previous approach where you have um, a boundary layer region that you, that, you, that you impose on and which gives you these kinks. And these kinks really result in unphysical stress concentrations. As you can see here with the present approach, um, there are no kinks and very close to the finite element uh, predictions. And here also the, um, the stress field is very uniform. And previous approach, you can see here near the boundaries, you have these concentrations. Okay. You can also directly impose the, uh, the boundary conditions by considering the weak form of paradynamics. And we start off with a principle of virtual work. And uh, here we split the domain as, as before, three regions, interior, outer, and the boundary layer region, no fictitious region here. So this, um, this equation is um, what ceiling derived in 2007. It could be ordinary state-based, bond-based, non-ordinary state-based. This is coming in from the, uh, applying the paradigmic differential operator on the, uh, the uh, equilibrium equations. That's the, uh, the paradigmic representation of the stress tensor. These are the applied tractions. An example of this is I can, we considered a bonded lap joint. Um, here we're using non-ordinary state-based paradigmics. 
And elastic, uh, we have uh, elastic adherence, we have viscoelastic adhesive, uh, both shear and bending occurs, geometrically nonlinear, you have failure due to creep. And uh, here we compare the paradynamic predictions for the displacements in the horizontal direction and the vertical direction coming from the paradynamic side and from the finite element side. There are no oscillations, they're in excellent agreement. And uh, failure prediction, we applied critical stretch criteria and it's under, uh, due to creep, as you can see, crack initiates here and it propagates. Um, so it, it, it's a demonstration of how you can enforce boundary conditions directly by using the weak form of paradynamics. Now, um, how do we couple finite elements with paradynamics, right? So again, we're gonna be using the concepts that I just described earlier. We're gonna use weak form of paradynamics. Uh, because it's consistent with the finite element formulation. The region is split into three re uh, region here. These are my attractions. This is the displacement constraints. And what I have here is there's no overlap zone here. Okay, this, is, this, this the blue region here is the, the boundary region coming from the paradynamic formulation here. And we have shared nodes along the PD and FE interface. So there's no overlap. And we use matrix 27 element, which is uh, part of the ANSYS element library to represent the paradigmic bonds, paradigmic interactions. So it's all, um, there are no user defined elements. And I'm gonna show you this example here. We considered this plate. Um, the interior region is the paradigmic region here. The outer region is the finite element region. So we model this with traditional elements. And between the, the PD region and the finite element region, we have the, um, the shared nodes, we only have one node. And then we have the, the PD boundary region, we have the PD outer region, we have the PD inner region. So we apply this load and then we hold it steady and we basically unload it, it's dynamic loading here. So we're going to solve this um, by using uh, ANSYS. Um, so as you can see here, the wave starts um, uh, propagating, um, it reaches the interface, so, um, and then um, goes through, and then um, it hits the other end, then starts propagating back. And as you can see, it's very smooth. There is no um, dispersion of any kind. Um, so it's, it also agrees very well with the finite element solutions. Um, so this is all implicit, smooth transmission of waves. There's no instability. And we compared the finite element predictions at this particular point here minus one and one. And it, you see very nicely captures the finite element predictions, this coupled PDFE. Okay. And as I mentioned before, um, there's no overlap. We only have one shared node for both finite elements and for the PD side. Now I'm gonna show you some, uh, some applications. So fiber reinforced polymer composites, we're gonna look at some residual strength prediction, compression after impact, damage due to cyclic loading, damage in both the joints. I'm going to show you uh, an example of ceramic matrix composites with the crack deflection, uh, rupture in polymers, and um, homogenization um, to, to determine effective material properties. So um, I'm not going to go into the details of um, how we come up with the, the paradigmic model for composites, but it's uh, pretty much the same as what I described. We have the ordinary state-based composite model. So the only difference is that we uh, distinguish the uh, paradigmic parameters in the fiber direction, in the transverse direction, and in the arbitrary directions, additional parameters. And also this is within the ply, but also between the plies, we have the interlayer normal bonds and interlayer, interlayer shear bonds. So we determine all of these bond constants in terms of the engineering constants that we know for a given ply. So here we have this um, um, laminate, it's a, a graphite epoxy, it's quasi-isotropic, um, the whole size varies between two to 9.55 millimeter. And uh, this uh, specimen is subjected to tensile loading and compressive loading. You can see um, the, um, the failure stress, um, the experimental results and the paradigm simulations here, the, um, depending on the whole size. But what's interesting here is if I look at the tensile loading and for a range of this uh, whole sizes, this is under tension, it's the ply level damage, matrix damage. So you hear as you go from a, a, a smaller hole size to a larger hole size, the, um, the slanting sort of becomes more perpendicular to the direction of the applied load, uh, 
pretty much for each ply that you see here. So this is, we're applying the same critical stretch criteria. We're not changing anything. The only difference is the size of the hole. And if I superimpose all of these plies on top of each other, this is a smaller hole size to a larger hole size. You see, um, it captures the experimentally observed behavior as the hole size increases, the nature of the, um, the failure changes. And next we'll look at the same um, laminate, this time on the compression. Now, um, if, you, if you remember for the smaller hole size, we had these slanted sort of a failure paths, but now it's very it's straight perpendicular to the direction of the applied load. Whereas for the larger hole size, you have the slanted uh, damage paths. And um, if I superimpose them all, as you can see here, as the hole size increases, very nicely captures what is observed also um, experimentally. And next I have the laminates um, um, under compression after impact. So we took the, uh, the experimental study by Sun and Halle, and uh, we simulated by using paradynamics. The material is, uh, we have quasi-isotropic, I am 78552. So this is first subjected to impact. And then um, we took this um, impacted specimen or the, the model and applied um, a compression under these boundary conditions here. So the damage prediction um, this is the top view, this is the bottom view. Um, and these are the superposition of all the damage that you have. So this is basically what happens after um, impact occurs. We have the damage due to impact. And then we applied um, the compression load. So I have these, uh, this particular uh, compressive load versus displacement response. So I'm showing you here prior to the failure load, the top view, the bottom view, and that's point A. And then at the onset of failure load, you see the top view presents um, the damage much less than what you see um, on, the, on the back face. And uh, after the failure load, there's a sort of substantial amount of damage that's taking place. But what's interesting here is um, we were about 10% off from the experimentally observed failure load. Okay. Um, then uh, we said, okay, um, what can we do? Um, can we address uh, fatigue damage? Um, so then we work with the data as part of this AFRL tech scout effort. Um, we obtained the data from uh, Steve Clay. And uh, again, materials IM79773, they considered three different layups. Um, in this particular layup, this, the last one is, is very soft. There are no zero degree applies here. And this is the maximum cyclic stress that they applied. And um, we applied bond breakage is based on the kinetic theory of fracture here. Okay. So we, in, in the, in, in the composite paradigmic model, we, we model each ply um, through the bonds, as I mentioned before. Also, we have bonds in between the layers. So, And kinetic theory of fracture was introduced by Coleman and, and Zurkoff and, uh, in the uh, 60s. And then later on, Furtick um, applied it to composites. So just one slide on the damage variable and, and uh, accumulation of the, um, uh, the uh, the, the, uh, basically the state, state, state variable that I have n. So we have this evolution equation here. Um, this is the activation energy. This is the activation volume. They come from the SN data. This sigma bar is the, the bond stress that you have. That's an equivalent stress. And so if you solve this um, differential equation subject to this constraint here, this lambda controls the shape of the uh, damage evolution curve. And uh, so you can rewrite this in its discrete form. And for specified number of cycles, which is n star here, you can compute the damage variable n. If it's one, it's failed. If it's not, if it's zero, it's an undamaged state. So based on this criteria, um, we break the bonds in the model. And here I'm showing you uh, for the quasi-isotropic uh, after 100,000 cycles and 1 million cycles, in the zero degree applies pretty much there is no matrix damage. And in the um, 90 degree plies, there's of course extensive amount of damage that you see. And the 45 degrees, you see the pattern is, is along the fiber direction. And of course, as expected after 1 million cycles, the damage is, is substantial. And same kind of damage patterns that you will see in, um, in the next uh, uh, laminates where you have, um, let me get rid of this. Um, so in this particular case, you have 60, 0, 60. And um, again, uh, here you see the damage pattern is taking place along the, uh, the direction of the, the fibers and the zero degree plies basically 
they take up all the load, there isn't um, really much damage that's taking place. And uh, let's see, the next one, um, we don't have any zero degree plies here, it's very soft. And um, again, I'm showing you some damage maps here, nothing different. Um, Here we have the uh, stiffness reduction due to cyclic loading. Right? So we basically um, compare what we predict against the experimental um, results. So for the first two, um, I think Paradynamics does a very good job uh, capturing the, uh, the sort of gradual decrease in stiffness under cyclic load. And it's an acceptable agreement. But for the last one, um, there's an initial decrease um, for about 100,000 cycles, and then it, it pretty much becomes um, constant and then, but the experiment, the experimental results show this gradual decrease. Uh, uh, so I don't know what the reason is, but this is uh, this is what, what it is. Um, my next uh, example is uh, bolted composite lap joints. So we considered um, these two studies published by Kamano and and Sun. Um, one in one case they have uh, this quasi isotropic laminate, in the other case it's cross ply. And no 45 degree plies. And they observed bearing failure. And in the, in the second one, because there are no uh, plus minus 45s, there's a, a shear failure. So we, we went ahead and, and we modeled this by using paradynamics. <clears throat> so in this case, we, we, we use paradynamics as a sub modeling tool. So we, we have the semi analytical model to determine the stress field, the displacement field from the, the semi analytical model. We have the, for the sub model, we have uh, cut boundary displacements. We impose them as boundary conditions and determine the, um, the damage in each ply. So as you can see here, in each of these plies, we have the, the matrix damage. And if I superimpose them all, um, this is the matrix damage, and I have the, uh, the interlayer damage here. And uh, here, what you, what you see here is, of course, a lot of the delamination and um, matrix failure takes place near the, the contact region, where you have the the bolt coming into contact with the laminate here. And uh, so we superimpose these, um, but I guess before that, I move on to the second case where you don't have any 45 degree plies. I'm looking at matrix damage in each ply. And again, it's uh, close to the, the region where you have the, the, the contact taking place between the bolt and the laminate. And um, the interior damage, uh, similar to what I showed before, now, this is the slide that I want to show you. So I superimposed all of these um, plies. And as you can see here, the damage maps um, very nicely capture the, the bearing failure and the shear out failure. So it's like very consistent with the experimental observations. Next, I'm going to show you crack deflection in a single strand um, ceramic matrix composites. What you see here is um, I have this. Um, uh, uh, fiber and it, surrounded by this matrix, then we have the surface crack here. And um, here what happens is I have a primary crack, that's the surface crack, as it propagates, depending on the, the strength of the interface, the secondary crack initiates, they coalesce, and then um, the crack gets deflected. So the distance um, it varies depending on the strength of the, uh, the interface. And also the thickness of the interface matters. For example, here in this case, there is no secondary crack initiation. The primary crack reaches the interface and then it deflects. Okay, so this is, it's all autonomous. We're using the same criteria. In this case, we use the weak form of paradynamics. So um, it very nicely captures what's, what's expected. And my next um, slide will have the, here I have the, again, this time we're looking at the cross section of this um, um, ceramic matrix composites. We have this initial crack subjected to displacements in an autonomous fashion. This crack grows in, and finds the energetically favorable sites, that is the interface, and gives you the, the path. So the ceramic matrix composites is really to have the crack propagation taking place through the, the interface rather than through the fibers. And um, my next example is on, um, I'm going to show you how you can apply paradynamics to look at um, uh, polymer type materials. This, this, is a, um, this is an experimental study by Zheng and his colleagues. And uh, they have an internal, uh, they have a, a, an edge crack here. And um, 
So the, the material is very complex. We use Anand's model. That's basically a chain over the Boris model with slight compressibility. And this is their experimental observation. And this is what we um, simulate as we are applying this uh, stretch and the crack starts opening up and then it starts growing and uh, very similar to what they observed experimentally. And also the nominal stress versus the stretch very nicely captures when the failure load, when the failure occurs. So you can also apply paradynamics um, to um, uh, determine effective material properties. So this uh, uh, study was uh, inspired by um, actually Wen Ben Yu. He started quite a bit of work in 2007. And then recently they came up with a paper in 2007 um, looking at some uh, micromechanics models. Okay, so they considered this woven fiber microstructure. Um, and um, we also applied our homogenization methods to determine material properties in different directions. Very nicely captures what other methods uh, also capture. Um, what's important here is that we can put uh, voids, defects, cracks in it. And I'm not going to show you here, but that's sort of um, what we've done. That was the sort of exciting part of it. And also um, another complicated model, they considered they have these um, um, short fibers, then the microstructure. Again, um, we model this paradynamics and very nicely captures the, uh, the material properties in different directions. So um, finally, I'm going to make some remarks. Um, Paradynamics is very general for damage prediction in different material systems. You know, damage initiates and gro grows spontaneously. Damage is part of the paradigmic equilibrium equations. You can use existing material models from the local theory. I showed you how you can directly impose boundary conditions in the weak form and the strong form. We have implicit solutions. Um, we verified against finite element analysis. We compared against experimental results. And I'll, I'll also show you a seamless coupling with FEM and ANSYS framework we only use the elements available in ANSYS. In this case, we use Matrix 27. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the funding that we received um, for the last um, about 10 years or 12 years, uh, especially from MURI, the Center for Material Prediction through Paradynamics. Also received uh, initial funding from NASA Langley, NAVER, SRC, Department of Energy, AFRL, Samsung, Boeing, Corning. And with this, I will um, stop. And if you have any questions, uh, I'll be more than happy to answer. Well, please try to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Manansi, for your very nice and also comprehensive uh, presentation. Before we start the Q&A session, I would like to remind, remind our audience that if they have any questions, uh, please uh, type your questions in the Q&A box. Fantastic. So happy that we got so many questions, and I'm so grateful to the Aerospace Division and Erdogan for, for participating today. Before we wrap up, I'd like to mention that if you're interested in obtaining a PDH certificate or would like to request a Tech Talk topic, look out for a follow-up email if you opted in to receive communications from ASME. If you have colleagues who are not able to join us for this Tech Talk, it will be posted within the ASME members page for the Tech Talk series typically within one to three business days. Next month's Tech Talk will be presented with the Materials and Energy Recovery Division, taking place on Thursday, November 18th at noon Eastern time. The title is Experimental and Theoretical Study on Combustion of PFAs. You can get more involved with topics like this and others at our 2021 IMECI virtual conference. Visit event.asme.org backslash IMECI for more information on the program. Registration is open. Lastly, if you're an ASME member and would like to join the technical division, visit asme.org and log in to your account. Click on additional info and here select up to five areas of interest by clicking edit next to each technical division. By doing so, you become a member of those entities. There's no additional dues for this, so we hope you all check out your technical division interests and join divisions. Thanks again to everyone for joining us today. We hope to see you again soon. Bye for now.